o'clock and I believe that this is um, being recorded and, and live streamed. So welcome everybody to this meeting. Uh, we have in attendance in the room, Alderman, uh, Alderman Briscoe, Alderman Barakas, Councillor Data and myself, and online we have uh, Councillor Harvey. So welcome everybody. I, uh, we have an apology from, um, or leave of absence from, from Councillor Coates. I'd like to uh, acknowledge that in recognition of the deep history and culture of this place, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which the city of Hobart was built. I acknowledge the determination and resilience of the Palawa people of Tasmania who have survived invasion and dispossession and who continue to, to, continue to maintain their identity, culture and rights. I recognise the value of continuing Aboriginal knowledge and cultural practice and pay my respects to Elders past and present and to any uh, Indigenous people uh, listening in today or here today. So we have nobody to co-op, do we, Mr Banks? No. Confirmation of minutes from last time. Councillor Data, thank you. Any comments? If not, uh, I'll ask you, Councillor Harvey, if you can just raise your hand for, for the vote as well. So those in favour of the minutes? Those against, items carried unanimously. Consideration of supplementary items, I think we have one, so I can have somebody move that, yes. please. Uh, Alderman Briscoe, thank you. Those in favour? Aye. Those against, items carried. Indications of pecuniary and conflicts of interest? Does anybody have any conflicts? None. Transfer of agenda items? No. Uh, Planning authority items, considerations of items with deputations, and I think um, it's in order of, of what would be um, the agenda is is going anyway. So, um, but we'd like, uh, can I have somebody move that? Thank you, Alderman Barakas. Those in favour? Those against? Item is carried. Uh, the com uh, committee is acting as a planning authority. 7.1.1 was an application under the Sullivan's Cove planning scheme. And um, I'll call the applicant's representative, Mr Tony Wright, who's from Group Engineering Manager of, S or who is the Group Engineering Manager of CLTP Tasmania. Mr Wright, if you'd like to just take a seat there, just in front of a, um, yes, on that, on that semicircular, table and if you can talk into one of the microphones please because that's how it's recorded thank you thank you very much for, for having me here um, yes my name is Tony Wright from Sullivan's Cove Distillery and I'm the project manager working on the Hugh and Keys site um, with our proposal for a distillery and uh, visitor centre um, Bit of brief background, um, Solon's Cope Distillery started 30 odd years ago, just down the road at the Gasworks, um, and uh, subsequently moved to Cambridge. We currently operate uh, out of Cambridge. Um, and the Hugh and Keys site is quite unique in that it gives us a chance to come home, as close to the Gasworks as we'll find, um, gives us a chance to uh, build a, a bespoke uh, distillery which will allow for an increase in production and also a visitor centre uh, befitting where we sit uh, in our business at the moment. Um, Sullivan's Cove Distillery, there's a few distilleries around Tasmania now. Um, about 10 years ago, we started to win World's Best Whiskey Awards for our single cast, single malt whiskey. And we've picked up three or four of those. Um, and in the last three months, we've picked up um, a World's Best uh, craft distillery um, out of the World Whiskey Awards in London. Um, so we sit as a low volume, high quality um, distillery. <coughs> the work that we've done to, to get the proposal in front of you today has involved quite a large amount of uh, engagement with different stakeholders, um, particularly around the, the heritage components of, of the uh, drill hole and our intent in our design uh, for the proposal is to take the drill hole back to its original state as much as possible in 1912 um, and basically put the, the new distillery that we're proposing on the footprint of uh, some of the, the other buildings that are there at the moment. Um, it's 
in quite a bit of involvement with heritage offices and the, the Tasmania Heritage Council, uh, clearly because it's, it's such a significant building. Um, and we think that we've come up with an option that, that'll preserve the building as it is, or as it was in 1912, uh, for you know, a couple of generations to come. Um, the two main reasons why I'm here tonight is one, there is one condition uh, in the agenda that I've been discussing with Ben Iken and Sarah White that I would like to uh, offer a, a rewording um, and then secondly to, to answer any questions. So if you'll allow, I'll just read uh, an email that Ben sent through to me earlier today. Certainly. Um, it's to do with condition, heritage condition S4 and regarding the interpretation strategy uh, being prepared for the site. On page 18. Thank you. Second, sorry. Sorry, I'm just letting the elected members know that it's on page 18, that, that condition. Um, the, the conditions that the Tasmanian Heritage Council put forward uh, for interpretation is basically to provide them with a strategy for approval um, three months before first use and to have it implemented within six months of, of occupancy. The, uh, the Hobart Council condition with the same item is to have that prepared prior to the commencement of construction. Um, and it, it puts us in a position where we don't feel we can give it the time and, and, and effort needed um, that having it ready uh, three months prior to first use. So what we're asking is that we, we change that uh, condition as worded to match what the Tasmanian Heritage Council um, provided. Uh, so, again, to, to read Ben's email here, um, the interpretation strategy must be prepared by a suitably qualified person to interpret the place's historic, cultural, heritage and significant significance. The strategy must be submitted and approved by council within three months of first use and must provide recommendations and details of interpretation in publicly accessible locations. The interpretation strategy and interpretation must include information regarding but not limited to the site's history, occupants, relevant photographs or illustrations and relate to all submitted and approved heritage conservation documents. The interpretation must be installed <coughs> within six months of first use. Um, so that's, that's that yep. condition. Um, we feel the, all the other conditions that are uh, put forward for the work um, are consistent with the amount of engagement and effort that we put in uh, during the design. Um, it's just that one that stands out. Thank you. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? Or well, I can open it up to questions and we might might get some questions more specific. And we'll start with you, Alderman Briscoe. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for that. It's an exciting um, proposal. Uh, and uh, the officers uh, seem to have given you the green light and probably this planning committee will give you the green light too. Um, the, um, so uh, Mr Iken has said an alternate condition that he would be happy with is the one you read out. Yep. Okay, well, that's probably um, fine with me. The second thing is the actual production of the whisky is happening in a purpose-built addition, presuming. <coughs> yes, and, and I think it's important to understand what's not going there as well. Um, the, the whisky distillation is, is, is quite a small process. Um, <coughs> the uh, barrel filling and storage and decanting and bottling and sales um, are quite a much larger space requirement and they will remain at Cambridge. So all we are moving is, is our still um, and a number of, of new stills in a very fit, fit for purpose um, uh, design building. There's been an awful lot of fire consultancies, which is, is, is probably where you're, you're yeah. coming from, having a distillery next to a, a wooden heritage building. Um, and, and to put things into context, the only storage of flammable liquid through the process is as it comes out of a spirit still in a stainless steel pipe into a stainless steel tank prior to be taking off site inside a tanker. So um, even through the early stages of distillation, it's, it's, it's not flammable uh, until it comes out of that final area. Um, and we have engaged specialists 
uh, distillation fire consultants out of Sydney um, and three fire engineers to review everything and the design of the building has been such to minimise any, um, you know, minimise as much as possible any risks associated with what we're doing. Um, so presumably you're having the still there, uh, uh, so is it a, a, a place people can see the still in operation, is that sort of? Yes, um, the, the, look, one of the things about Cambridge at the moment, uh, the, the lovely concrete tilt panel shed that we operate out of is not conducive to world's best whisky award winning tours. Um, and having this building will allow us to incorporate uh, a visitor experience that will show people up close um, so you'll be able to feel the heat and smell all the smells and, and walk through a, a mezzanine platform that we've designed into the, the building. Um, so you know, you're within a metre or so of the stills themselves. Um, and then the aim is to use the drill hall space itself um, as somewhere where you would sit down for tastings um, and, and you know, come in for... Yeah, more of a comment than a question to finish. Uh, presumably in the 70 or 80 years it was operated as a naval base, none of those Navy people would ever th think that this would be a site of a whiskey distillery. <laughs> No. Pretty sure there's no association with alcohol at that site at all. Alden <laughs> Brackets. <laughs> uh, I had some questions, Chair, but uh, Alden Briscoe has asked them all for me, so I'm. Okay. Councillor Harvey, do you have any questions? Only a clarification. I'm looking at page 18, as suggested by the uh, director, and I can't see any time frame. Maybe I've missed something in this, but the. Uh, what are we looking at? HERS4 yes. interpretation strategy. Is that what? Yes. Yeah. Talking about it, it, I can't read any. I can't see any time frame in that. I believe there's a phrase that says price That's, construction, yeah. which isn't actually a, a time. It's it's more. Of a... I, I, no, I'm, I'm having problems hearing you. Director, could you translate for me? Yeah. Um, the hey, um, the the condition that you're referring to is the current condition as worded. Um, the proponent is uh, advocating for a in inclusion of a, um, a specific time frame after commencement of construction or occupation and we've had some consultation today around that and we are supportive of that. I'm just going to forward you a copy of that reworded condition. Um, so Perhaps you could share the screen. Um, Craig can share the screen. Yep. Uh, with that condition. Might be easier for everybody to yeah. see it. Uh, any any questions of Mr Wright? Councillor Harvey? No, look, I'm just struggling to hear it clearly. Um, uh, but it sounds so fine to me. I mean, the... I agree in principle, I just didn't understand what the um, amended condition was. Yeah, just, just try and speak into the microphone, but we're almost done, I think. Uh, Councillor Dutta, do you have any questions? No, I just wanted to see that, so thank you. Okay, it, that's up on the screen now. Um, and uh, I just have a couple of questions. So um, the, the water that you require, uh, would that be av available at, at or, or like, would that be part of the process here or? Um, the, the water usage during the production um, you know, our, our still at the moment is two and a half thousand litres, and we use that three times a week. It's, it's not a very high uh, water demand, um, and we would take standard potable water and treat it and store it and then use it within the, the process. Uh -huh. So it's not from some wild stream somewhere? No, no. <laughs> uh, and I'm just, just curious to know to two other things so the accessibility and like um, getting onto the site for people with disabilities has that been considered in in your your plan absolutely um we have landscaped the the, the front area of the building primarily to meet dda requirements mm -hmm. there's lift access to all parts of the drill hole there's lift access within the production building to get onto the mezzanine for the tour. Um, and three uh, disabled uh, DDA car park spaces right. uh, yep. on Good. the site. 
Yeah, no, it's just I know that's something to be considered um, in the in the next um, phase with building code. But um, it's good to to know those things. And just just uh, the, can you just describe yeah, that yeah. connection that you you're making um, with uh, I think the bike track or or down towards the the pavilion? Um, yes, but I'll, I'll preface that by by saying first, if I may. Um, Fundamentally, the, the, the business economics of this is to produce whisky. The, the visitor experience is, is important to share with everyone our, our, our story and, and what we do, but it's, it's a whisky distillery that has a tourist component, mm -hmm. not a tourist facility that also makes whisky. Yeah, yeah. Um, so at the moment, you know, the, the, the bike path um, the increased use of scooters, uh, the fact that it's only 800 metres from the city, the city centre with, with good you know, walkways and that sort of stuff, we would see that a number of visitors you know, would make use of that. Um, and we are in discussion with TASRAIL at the moment as custodians of the rail corridor that's not a rail corridor, um, that is, and, and the best ways to, to get across that. Um, and, and the reason I preface that the way I did is, uh, yes, it's, it's a, a method of getting people safely into the property. Um, so is the jetty that's not part of our process or our lease uh, yet. Um, but there's a number of things there that uh, we will work through with the relevant stakeholders to improve the access um, and you know, that, that contribute to the site but don't restrict the site operating successfully. Um, and one of the, the key things with, with Tasrail is they're, they're a bit hesitant to talk to us in depth about what that looks like uh, until we, we get through this process and we're closer to, to actually doing work. Okay, all right, so these are really mock-ups and, and plans uh, as part of you, these, these landscape plans, um, are potential. Yeah. Okay. All right, if there are no further questions, uh, I'll uh, ask you to take your seat again. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll open the item for, for discussion. Alderman Barakas. Um, thank you, Chair. I'll just start with a couple of questions. I think one of them's already answered. So these, um, the, the change of the up, updated conditions, we are comfortable with them? Or, uh, yeah. That's correct, Chair. Yeah. Yep. yep. And, and so just by a follow-up, is there, what's the reason that if the if what we're suggesting now is the updated conditions are closer to what the um, the Heritage Council suggested, why were ours sort of I suppose more onerous or more 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 strict as far as the timings? Is there a reason for that? Or um, look, we lo normally like to um, see these plans uh, having been developed prior to you know construction work being undertaken because uh, it's important that uh, those plans are informed by the current uh, fabric and, and uh, if that's lost then there might be some loss of information that might inform that plan so yeah look yeah I'm, yeah I'm not sure but I think in, in this instance we had further discussions with the applicant were reasonably satisfied with their their um, um, in, intentions, so uh, we were happy to accommodate that. Ah, uh, thank you for that. Look, I'm. Well, that's another thing. This is a, this is exciting. It seems to pretty um, clearly be something that was designed in, in in the scope of the scheme and compliance. So I think what it'll bring to the area um, is very exciting. As a as a fan of whisk, good whiskey myself, and uh, I think the the benefits it'll give to the area and revitalise it. So I'm happy to move that with the updated. Um, suggested conditions. Thank you. Alderman Briscoe? Uh, look, I think uh, <laughs> Alderman Barakas got in and uh, said a lot of things I was saying. I agree it's a fantastic uh, proposal. Uh, a lot of people travel to Tasmania to do the wine and now sometimes travel to Tasmania to do the whisky tours. Uh, my, it, it's so common now that one of my neighbours down at Shack has got a, a um, whiskey distillery and uh, my plumber's got a whiskey distillery so uh, there's a lot of 
a lot of movement in the whisky distillery industry, but uh, I think this is a good utilisation of uh, very significant heritage buildings, and plus the new buildings that have to be um, adjacent buildings that have to be built. It's a good uh, integration. Hopefully, the tram museum alongside it will also have a, a um, uh, some kind of effect, a good effect on positive on both things, and and obviously when the cycleway through Macquarie Point gets going again, hopefully, in the near future, that's another good connection to the city. So, no, I support that motion as amended by that extra change of that condition. Thank you. Further discussion? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Councillor Harvey. Uh, to you, Director. So, the entrance to this facility, that'll be straight down um, the, the um, whatever the road's called off the highway and over the uh, the railway lines it won't be through the car park and down the S bend um, are you with me yes I am with you now well there's uh, depending on um, what purpose deliveries are off McVilly Drive to the uh, driveway down to the slip yards in terms of access uh, for disabled uh, that is off the it's been down to the um, re lower regatta grounds. Yep. And pedestrian access is uh, via the overpass over the rail line and a, um, a, a new footpath that connects into that, I suppose, eastern end of the uh, site. Okay. Yep, that's answered it. Yep. And the second part is um, how does this interact with the tram shed? Yeah. Like how far apart are they? Um, you know, yeah. yep. the tram sheds came before this. Is there a, a need to adjust the tram sheds in any way to accommodate both facilities, or everything's fine? Yeah. They're two yep. separate builds. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, there was um, that, that was referred to, and there was a plan uh, included within the documentation showing that, and um, and in fact that was considered i think th those matters were considered when the tram shed was put in so um all, all uh i suppose um um uh, you know uh, there's sort of a symbiotic relationship there as as, as mentioned by alderman briscoe but uh, the physical location is uh, not impacted to any uh, significant degree by either of the proposals on each other so Yep, that, that should okay. be fine. Okay, well, yeah, uh, Chair, I think it's a, a pretty good development for that site. It's been sitting under loved for I don't know how long now. Um, and it'd be um, good to see it restored um, to its former glory. I know some of it will be demolished, but I, you know, I think the outcome is um, quite significant for Hobart, even though I'm not a drinker and I you know, won't be riding my scooter there to um, test the, the, you know, the, the whiskey, but um, I think it will be popular and being a, a certain distance from the city, I think is nice as well. So as was referred to, the, you know, the, the scooter ride away or the walk away from the city, I think will be quite significant. People might arrive by foot along the, the um, intercity cycleway there if it ever gets completed again. Mm -hmm. But Thank it's got my support tonight. Thank you. Councillor Dutta, do you have anything to add? Uh, just uh, endorse the comments made and I would support it too. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and Director, can you just tell me um, what's the ownership of, of the building? Is it owned by the proponents or is it a lease arrangement? Uh, it's a lease arrangement as I understand it. It's owned by Tasports. Uh, um, so it would be a certain period of time? Yeah, that, that I assume so, uh, Chair. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it was privately owned at one stage and then uh, acquired uh, by Tasports and uh, subsequently. Thank you. Uh, and um, just are there conditions during construction or or even beyond construction as to just making sure that, that the um, pedestrian and and um, uh, bike users and scooter users are kind of uh, considered with the truck movements and all of that sort of stuff? Is that a condition? Uh, no, not, not, not as such. I mean, the, I think the truck m movements are fairly minimal. I, th I think they are uh, potentially uh, one uh, truck movement for grain in 
and one truck movement out for the, the product. There might be other um, truck movements, but um, um, given the nature of the road um, and the access to the slip yards, it's fairly minimal increase in activity. And so during construction, but also with the increased um, visitation, um, is, is that conditioned or is there a traffic impact? Yeah, there's, there's minimal on-site on car parking, so mm -hmm. there won't be an opportunity for uh, vehicle movements to uh, ne necessarily significantly increase for, for visitors. I, I mean, clearly you, you could be dropping off or, or the like, but the, nature, the location of it is such that um, um, being close and very well connected to the CBD makes it a fairly pleasant uh, um, stroll uh, and is well connected uh, by cycleways and the like. So we're not envisaging a, a significant uh, in, in increase in... Yeah. I suppose the, the greatest impact will be on, on pedestrians and cyclists, but I see ENG TR2 looks like it, um, that condition looks at uh, um, communications and, and during construction anyway. Yep. All right, thank you. All right, so if there's no further comment, uh, we'll, we'll um, put the motion as moved and slightly amended by Alderman Barakas. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Uh, item, that was four. Councillor Harvey? Yep. Uh, uh, passed unanimously. So that will go to full council next Monday. Thank you very much. Before we just leave this item, could I just ask a very quick question? I, I meant to ask it. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, and is it, uh, it's come before us, there was no representation. It's come before us um, because it involves our land somewhere along the line? Yeah, because it involves part of our land yeah, uh, being okay. that walkway. Thank That's you. correct. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move to uh, 7.2.1 and we're considering applications under the interim Hobart Interim Planning Scheme. This is 19 Beach Road, Sandy Bates, uh, awnings, alterations to seagrass. Uh, can I have somebody move that, please? Alderman Barakas. Is there any discussion or comment? If not, um, I'll put that. Those in favour? Aye. 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 Those against? Items carried. Item uh, 7.2.2 is one Powell Street, Sandy Bay. It's partial develop demolition alterations and extension. And I think um, uh, most of the, the representations were around traffic and parking. Um, is there, can I have somebody m m I'll move this? Thank you, Councillor Data. Uh, any discussion or comments? And is there any sort of plan for, for parking as part of this, Mr Noy? Um, so the, the only discretion uh, with this is heritage and um, we're reasonably satisfied. We have put an advice uh, clause in this one to, um, I suppose, bring to the attention of the uh, applicant um, and ultimate builder the need to minimise uh, disruption to uh, parking arrangements within um, this location, tight location, Power Street. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, at, at this point in time, that's all we can uh, require. Okay, thank you. All right, if there's no further discussion or comment, uh, I'll put that. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Items carried. 7.2.3 is Bathurst Street, Hobart, uh, change of use to visitor accommodation. You'd like to move that, Alderman Briscoe? Oh, yeah, no, I've got a couple of questions first, though. Uh, yes. or, or before or after. Um, I noticed there was only two representations against it. I, I thought our delegation, uh, our um, delegation, I think we needed five representations to come before this committee. It's, it's three, uh, it's three. Oh, three. Yeah, uh, but this was called in by an elected member. Ah, right. Um, and I know uh, the representations are confidential, but I know them because I, I have access to the representations. Can we have confirmation that the representations weren't from neighbouring, uh, from neighbours? Uh, look, I could... Uh, I look at a representation, yes. I can tell the answer, but I just wanted to... Yeah, uh, look, I'd need to, I haven't, um, I'd need to have a look at the representations, so I'll confirm. I think it, it, it's always confidential. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, we, could, we can clarify that for you. Yeah, thank you. 
any uh, further comments in relation to, to this application? No. So uh, Alderman Briscoe has moved this. Uh, I'll uh, put this, uh, put, put the motion. Those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? No. Show of hands. Those in favour? And those against? So that's carried and I don't think that goes to council, does it? I think it does. Oh, it does. Yeah, right. Okay, it goes to council. All right. Uh, should we go to the uh, supplementary now, Dave? Yep, okay, so before we go to the reports, we'll go to um, 11, uh, item 11, number 20, McVilly Drive, so we're back to Sullivan's Cove planning scheme and its, its signage in relation to artwork. Alderman Briscoe. I'm happy to move it. Thank you. Hmm. Discussion about uh, Tom O'Hearn's artwork. Alderman Barakas. Thank you. Uh, I initially looked at this and thought it was, I initially only saw the, uh, the sun and I thought this is a bit strange, but the more I read into it, it was actually pretty, it's actually quite cool. I think it's quite, um, you know, the, the way that it, it lays out the distances and sizes and, um, you know, matter space being something I always find interesting. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting and quite, yeah, I think it's uh, very positive. So I'd be happy, I'm happy to support this one. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? If not, I'll put the motion that's moved by Alderman Briscoe. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Item is carried unanimously. Go back to the agenda again and we go now to reports. So um, 8.1 is the regional strategy uh, adapting to a change in coastline in Tasmania. I'm happy to move the recommendation. Alderman Briscoe, thank you. And uh, in saying that, I think it's a very important Report. I did look very carefully through it. I think it's very timely as well. Um, I know the council has done some work in the past to look at the inundation of a couple of places around the city. I think America West Bernard and down in Sandy Bay there. We've got a detailed report there. Um, just a question, because I've had a bit of a technology <laughs> glitch here and I can't get hub up anymore, but a question I had uh, through you, Chair, to, um, uh, to the director, um, it does say, for example, if, if a neighbour, if a, a resident who lives in a house needs to do work on public land to protect their property, uh, it said something like an uh, assessment what, what the public benefit would be. Can, uh, I don't know whether the author of the report is here in the room, uh, but... Uh, 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 I don't know whether we've got Miss Graham on the phone, oh, online. Yeah, perhaps Miss Graham. Ah. <laughs> Hello, Ms. Graham. Welcome. Did you hear Alderman Briscoe's question? <coughs> we can't hear. Technology. I'm here. here. Um, yes, I did hear. So the question was around whether or not if a, a private residence had to do land work on public land, what yep. the process would be. Is that correct, Alderman Briscoe? Uh, that's right. And uh, and uh, it said it, they would be allowed to, provided it provided a public benefit. I'm just interested to know what the public benefit test would be. Uh, the public benefit test would be along the lines of you would be doing an assessment of the public values and public worth, so um, in terms of all the values that are associated with that piece. So you'll notice in the actual strategy itself, it talks about doing um, coastal management plans and through that process that would allow you to identify the public um, benefit. Now it's going to be comprised of ecological, cultural, historic, how the heritage as in Aboriginal heritage as well as cultural. Um, it's going to be the, um, the econ sorry, economic value in terms of protecting any other assets and things that might sit behind that would be um, benefit from it as well. There'd be issues of public access. Those sorts of things would come into actual final assessment as to the overall public benefit. Uh, I wonder if I could just get that elaborated a little bit more with a scenario. I, I know this is a high level strategy, so, but uh, I was just thinking of, um, say inundation was causing minor uh, undermining of someone's foundation and they needed access to the uh, public land uh, to do some underpinning or whatever they have to do, you know. Um, uh, it would protecting private property be, and it could be quite expensive private property if it's Sandy Bay, for example, uh, 
it's a judgment call, I know, but um, can you see a situation where you would say no? That a pro well, I think you'd have to consider a whole lot of things yes. in terms of one, if it's, if it's public land, it would be the tenure, so who the tenure belongs to. So the tenure typically sits with the Crown unless it's held by the city under um, a lease arrangement. Um, so the Crown has its stated position, as you'll see in, in the section here on legal, where basically they're saying natural processes will be allowed to go ahead yeah. unless there's some sort of um, arrangement can be come to with the Crown. Come to the crowd. Effectively, what this is saying is that in most instances, there would not be a situation where um, public, private works could be done on public land for the benefit of purely of just a public, a private asset. Right. Yeah, I was thinking. Um, was it, I, I can understand um, private works done on public land. I was thinking of private works done on pr private land and that needed access through the uh, private. Uh, you can't imagine that we'd ever have a situation that you, uh, if, if for example, um, they had to do some underpinning, as I said, just getting access to something. But look, it's a hypothetical, because I, I, as I read through the report, I was saying, yes, 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 that's good, that's good, that's good. So I don't want to uh, dismiss that. So I just, just that one thing came to mind, that uh, what situations where we would uh, refuse access to, uh, to get yeah. to private land. But anyway, I think it's more of a minor detail at this stage. Yeah. yeah. If it was an access issue, I doubt very much whether that would impinge or impact on them being able to do those works. I don't see that being a problem. It would be where they're trying to locate yep. private works on public land yep. to protect a solely a private asset that there is no public benefit for. Good. And that Thank public benefit would be around, you know, like um, protecting other p public assets. It would be around... Um, the community, the public's enjoyment and access and use of those areas. It would be around any ecological, cultural or heritage type values that are attached to that land and there would also be an economic component to that. If there's any economic benefit and also who pays? At the end of the day, I think this is really going to come down to who pays for that public, uh, the private work um, and who owns that risk and that risk would sit with um, the private landholder. I think this ties ties in um, with with a lot of that Minter Ellison work that we we heard as well. You know that yes, that yes, liability yes. and trying to reduce <laughs> reduce risks uh, for councils having to foot the bill or or um, other other levels of government having to foot the bill. Uh, any further questions or comments? Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Councilor Harvey. Uh, thanks, Katrina. I'm, I'm happy with this report and I support it. And what I think this does, it, it gives absolute clarity with what the situation is going forward into the future with regard to sea level rise, coastal erosion, whatever other consequences of climate change might be dropped upon your neighbourhood or your coastal area. Um, and the expectation is that council can't come to the rescue, that council won't pay exorbitant costs for um, defending territory, defending the coastline against um, the impacts of climate change. So I'm quite um, impressed with this work and I think it will provide a certain, you know, like a lot of certainty for the public understanding what the consequences are um, and how councils will react to requests to try and defend um, individuals' land or areas of land that are indefensible and not be looking at wasting resources on something that may or may not be able to um, mitigate the problem. So I'm, I'm quite satisfied with this um, strategy or this, um, sorry, report. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and uh, I'll just note that um, you know there are those those ten areas that are, have been identified, which are important um, coastline or riverine areas for for um, our city and there's um, there'll be a community <coughs> engagement proposed for those areas um, so that the community ha can have input but also are educated as we as we go along there and that uh, a lot of this work has already been uh, noticed by other councils and other regions across Tasmania so the Southern, Southern Tasmania Council's authority has, has worked really hard to get to this point. So I thank you, Katrina, for your, your work in this space. 
All right, so if there are no further questions and you don't have anything to add, Mr Noy? No, no look, I think it's just a, a, you know, a critical piece of, um, I suppose, principal development uh, around this issue that we know we're co confronted with. And um, uh, it's important to set these fundamental principles that we can work to. Thank you. Oh, sorry, uh, Chair, Brisbane. just one um, final question from me. <laughs> anyway, mm. uh, uh, it did come to mind that it did say somewhere, and I, I haven't got my technology working again, but I can't find it, that the cost would be minimal. Um, um, uh, but we will have a budget uh, proposal uh, in the current uh, upcoming budget. Uh, 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 through, yeah, through you, Chair. Yes, it's, um, look, it's, we, we're, we're still working through the budget at the moment, so um, it's it will be around the 50, uh, 50 to seventy thousand mark for this work uh, to be done. Um, so we'll, but we're working through our budgetary uh, yes. uh, requests at the moment, so we can't be definitive. Yeah, that, that sounds like it's about right, isn't it? If we can get that, because it is a significant risk to the whole community if we don't have the right planning documents. All right. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you again, Katrina. I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Item is carried unanimously. So that will go to full council next Monday. Thank you very much. Uh, item 8.2 is uh, this significant tree nomination public walkway between uh, Beaumont Road and Ruth Drive. Mr Noy, did you want to add anything in particular about this? as well? Uh, um, look, we, uh, clearly we um, called for expressions of in, uh, interest around uh, significant trees. We did get, um, we did get uh, some interest and this tree in particular was identified. However, we've done, we've done um, extensive assessment of it uh, and there's been uh, arborist reports in relation to it and we're reasonably satisfied that um, the tree uh, can go uh, and um, uh, replaced by a suitable alternative uh, tree uh, as a replacement. So. Alderman Briscoe? Uh, Chair, yes, look, it's, it, it's sad, a tree this size and a significant species as well, uh, some kind of peppermint, I think, like peppermint, um, or it probably says it somewhere here in the documentation, but um, just looking at the photographs, it doesn't look a very healthy tree. It looks like there's a lot of uh, dead limbs, and and from a risk point of view, it would probably wouldn't pass that. Now, if the committee had another view, which poss possibly they would, it may have, um, uh, we would go and do a further assessment. Say, so, say for example, the committee chose to uh, nominate this as a significant tree, um, then. then we would do for the council officers would do further assessment of the tree well, in terms of its um, health. Well, I think we we have sufficient evidence to suggest that uh, the tree is not healthy, uh, and it does uh, pose a risk. Noting the public walkway um, adjacent to it, so I think we're reasonably satisfied that uh, it it one it doesn't satisfy the criteria, and two there is given its uh, state of health, um, does not warrant uh, being retained. Yeah. So on page um, 713, um, there's some, uh, uh, the um, people who have asked this tree to be removed have also had some arborists look at it as well. Yeah. So you wouldn't disagree with their conclusion? No. Thank you. Further discussion? Alderman Barakas. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not sure if Council of Alderman Briscoe has moved that. I'm happy to, to, to I move. I think you did. Oh, I look, I did. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, look, so just, to, so just to clarify through you, Chair. So the, the tree itself is possibly unhealthy and also just going off the, the wording isn't wouldn't be considered to be in individually significant in its contribution to the ecological community. Is that, is that correct? No, so, correct. just a few pages earlier, um, on page 707 of the report, it, does, it is made pretty clear that this tree, you know, being removed, 
in exchange in 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 exchange for other landscaping, um, will also make way for a new house to be developed. And I, I see this as a win-win all around. We've got a tree that's unhealthy, um, and and the tree that will be removed will be replaced by other other trees, and we'll and we'll have another another house, another dwelling to add to our stock. So I, I see this as a uh, as a um, uh, a simple one for me, and I'm happy to move that and support it. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. You're, you're on mute. Go on mute. I'm not. You, you're receiving over. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> conversation. Um, yeah, look, I'm not familiar with the, the lay of the land in this area other than Googling Earth it, if that's the way you say it. Um, can someone inform me whether or not there are other white gums in the vicinity and whether this is the biggest white gum in the area uh, or whether it's got relatives close by? Mr Noy? Uh, look, I, sorry, um, I, I can't advise that uh, looking at uh, Google Earthing, um, it, it does uh, indicate that there may be other trees in the vicinity, but uh, some of those might be lost as a result of um, as a result of uh, development in this location. So, but um, w within the uh, subdivision, recent subdivision, but I, I do also um, note that there are other significant trees in the vicinity in uh, Ruth Drive, by the looks of it. So there are some other significant trees in, in the immediate area, but um, not, not many. Okay, so we don't know whether this is the last white in that vicinity, but uh, a couple of other questions with regard to the, the planting proposal by the person, by the, the, um, the people who are keen to get rid of this tree. Um, has that been agreed by the council? Denied. Have our council officers signed off on the species? Point. Um, the replanting area of the walkway. Yeah. Um, look, I'm not. Look, I need to take that on notice, uh, Chair. I just, um, just. Because I'd like to think if we're going to compensate for this this tree being cut down, and, and, in, and in normal circumstances it would just die a dignified death um, rather than being cut down and provide habitat for another hundred years. Yeah. So, before it falls down. Um, so, sorry, Chair. Um, just um, 5.9.7 stipulates in uh, page September, uh, page 710. It says yep. in, in, in September uh, 2021, the city indicated the tree could be removed subject to landscaping plan, open space permit, and removal by professional arborist, all at the landowner's con uh, cost. These requests okay. were satisfied and additional information provided. So you're satisfied with the landscaping plan? I've had a look at it, and I think most of the plants are uh, indigenous, but I'd just like it to be covered off by our council, you know, the appropriate staff member to say that they think this is a good compensation yep. for bumping off this tree. Yep. No, that, that, that's uh, certainly my understanding, Chair. That, that, that plan would have to be endorsed by our officers before implementation. And council officers are in agreement that this tree is expendable. Uh, that, that's correct. Uh, they've um, one they've com uh, considered it uh, so far as a significant tree register, and they believe that it it doesn't fulfil th that criteria. And secondly, uh, they've uh, endorsed it as um, the um, I suppose the land owner of the walkway and feel that its removal is appropriate uh, as a land manager as well. So sorry, when you say the land owner of the walkway, who owns the walkway? Uh, the council owns the walkway. Okay, so this is on our land? That's correct. And it's over, it does overhang a neighbour's fence, is that correct? And they want to do a development? That, that's correct. Okay, so if they weren't doing a development, would we cut this tree down? Um, look, I think, um, the risk assessment would indicate, and, well, given the information that we have available to us now, I think we would be forced to remove it, given the risks that, um, or si significantly um, modify 
uh, or, or prune uh, back, but I think given its health, um, health state that we would seek to remove it. Yeah, I'm just cautious about, keep, you know, we continue to remove trees um, all across the landscape here, and I just yeah. don't see how it aligns with our, our tree strategy of 40% canopy by, by 2030 or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but but if, if the professional advice, at multi, um, at multiple professional advice, is that this tree is buggered, um, then I guess I'll, I'll go along with bumping it off, but I'm not happy about it. I just think we've got to be do as much as we can to save trees, and that would include not putting a concrete path over the root zone, which you know, which doesn't necessarily help its um, health. Okay. Anyway, that'll, that's enough for me. All right. Thanks, Councillor Harvey. Councillor Dutton, did you have anything to add? Uh, no, no. The, my, my reasoning for this is to go along with the, sub, the uh, report because of the risk attached to it. And I think it was quite convincing for me. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Noy, I think I um, uh, just have a, a question. So, and it's, it's similar to what uh, Councillor Harvey has asked about how many, how many other trees are in that vicinity, um, but it's, it's more about how many trees um, have been removed in this subdivision. Um, I mean, it's not probably a question you could really answer, um, but it does seem to me that um, there is a there is a loss of of uh, habitat, um, and obviously this tree is not considered as significant by the panel. Um, but uh, I wonder how many trees have been removed that that uh, you know do have that significance that you know we've we've lost before before the time. So it's um, you know like it's it's a travesty in some some ways where those landscape values um, seem to be uh, thrown under a bus in some ways for for um, <coughs> in these particular areas that we're subdividing. Uh, and houses are getting larger, um, and heat heat islands are occurring. So, actually, having you know, landscaping or natural landscape values of uh, things that you don't really want to um, have have lost. All right. So, Alderman Briscoe has moved this. I don't think it had any amendments, did it? Um, I'll put the motion. Those in favour. Those against. I'll say no, but you know, like it's just really um, my my concern about about a broader context. But um, uh, so that's carried, and we'll go to full council, presumably. Uh, yes, it's on council land. Okay. Yep. Okay. We we'll get uh, to eight point three is the city planning advertising report. Ms. Aby, anything to? To uh, of, of note here. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just draw the committee's attention to Six Russell Crescent, which um, is for those of you who may be familiar with Wing and Co. as it used to be. That's now being developed or proposed to be developed into a bakery and restaurant, and making some changes to the units which are already there. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, provide a bit of an explanation about the visitor accommodation applications. Um, there's one on that was determined this evening, two coming to the committee next round. Uh, one was a refuse, refusal to provide extension and so that's been determined at officer level and two where there were no amenity discretions and they've also been determined at officer level. All right, thank you. Can I have somebody move that please? Alderman Barakas, thank you. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Items carried. Thanks, Ms. Aby. Uh, 8.4 is delegated decision report planning. Alderman Briscoe, thank you. Uh, have, um, I'll put that. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Item is carried. Questions without notice? Have any questions without notice? I've got a, I've got Alderman a couple. Barakas. Thank you, Chair. I've got a couple through you. First one, and I'm not sure if this is one that we can ask in the open or the close, so I'll try my luck and we'll see how we go. Um, the short stay item that we discussed just earlier tonight, that was called forward by an elected member. Are you able to say who that elected member was? Um, I think we, I don't know. Which, which it, it was the chair. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and then separately, um, the in regards to the, um, the 30 year 
Greater Hobart Plan, the one that's been put out. Um, Sorry, Chair, could could you get Alderman Barakas to speak more clearly into Thank the you. microphone and stop fidgeting? <laughs> 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 um, yes, it's, that, it's that Councillor Harvey. Receiving, yep. Very good. It's, it's, yeah, sometimes a little bit he hard to hear you, Alderman uh, Brown. All, all so good, all you. good. I'll do my best. Um, in regards to that, so what involvement exactly has this council had in regards to the drafting of that document? Um, and then the follow on question from that is before this was signed off on by the Lord Mayor, what, and I know Council received a briefing on this, but what actual input into the contents of this document have other elected members had? Uh, look, I'll, I'll take that on notice and provide a written response. It is coming to Council though, isn't it? Oh, uh, well, it yeah. will, yes, uh, it yeah. will come to Council. Yeah. All right, any further questions? Alderman Briscoe. Uh, on the same thing that... Uh, Alderman Barak has uh, brought up about short stay, uh, and I know we're all entitled to call in, uh, call in um, uh, applications. That's our right, and I don't dispute that. Um, um, how much extra work is there when uh, for the officers when applications of any type get called in? Mr. Noy, does a fuller report have to be written? Or? I mean, a, a full report is written. Anyway, um, in the same but, format. Sorry. Um, yes. Yeah. Same format. So it, the, obviously there is uh, work associated with um, um, managing the committee item. So there'd be some additional work associated with that that wouldn't otherwise be the case if it wasn't called in, for example. So through you, Chair, again, just to clarify that a little bit more. You would, uh, it seemed like um, from a previous item um, that um, even though it was called in, it couldn't be dealt with by committee because um, the applicant um, uh, wouldn't agree to extra time. Yeah. Through, through you, Chair, um, I've consulted with the Manager of Governance. Uh, and we've reviewed the committee's um, terms of reference. It doesn't include the power to decide items that have been called in, so that power reverts to the council. Uh, I, I don't know whether it, that was the question I asked. <laughs> the question I asked was, uh, say for example, someone put in an application, someone called it in, but it ran out of time before it could come to committee or council. Yeah. Under those circumstances, it can't be called in because it would um, run out of time, in which case officers would make a determination under its delegation. Okay, and final question, and as I said, I, I don't uh, deny elected members calling in applications, but has there been a call in of all applications to do with short stay accommodation? Uh, no. No, just so it's going individually by individual. Uh, no, the, um, look, uh, I'll provide uh, a response to that question in writing. Thank you. Any further questions? I have uh, a couple of questions. Given the uh, current interest in, in short stay accommodation uh, items, um, could you, Director, provide um, information as to how many um, submissions uh, were received in relation to the plan planning scheme amendment? Uh, look, I take that one on notice, Chair. Um, I, we haven't done a final figure on that, but it's around the 100 mark, so I'll give you an exact figure in writing. Thank you. All right, and um, uh, Ms Abey, you mentioned that there was um, a decision made which had a number of representations but didn't get to committee. Um, could you just explain why um, that, that couldn't be, um, the report couldn't be done in relation to that in, in time? Uh, thank you, Chair. The date, the application was due to expire um, before the item could be determined by the council. Uh, and in those circumstances uh, where we don't have 
the time for the council to determine the application. We've asked the applicant for an extension of time. In this situation, it was re that application request was refused. So we're left with the situation where we either make a decision at officer level or we don't. And if we don't, we run the risk that the applicant will make an application to the tribunal for a permit to be issued and the council would bear the costs of that appeal. And how many representations did we have in relation to that? Two representations for that one. Two representations? And there was a, 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 another one for where we had six representatives. Two and six, yeah. six representations. Yeah. So it would have, that would have gone to full council at that yeah. point. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? You've um, prompted me, uh, uh, <laughs> Chair, it is to do with short stay as well. Mm. Uh, whilst I can't refer to any detail, there is an item on the uh, close to do with an appeal to, about short stay, um, where council officers um, uh, recommended approval and the council in its wisdom recommended refusal. Point of, point of order. What's no, point I, of I'm order? talking about no, general, excuse sorry, me. Right, what, what's right your point of order, Councillor Harvey? Uh, we're not in the closed. Uh, I'm not sure why Alderman Briscoe is trying to disclose information in the closed in a circuitous kind of way. Um, so, should you save his question for the closed? Thank, thank you, Councillor Harvey. Um, I, I think if you take that on, on notice, I wonder, I wonder if I Briscoe, could explain a little bit more yeah. because I think it is an open uh, agenda item because, um, in terms of how many appeals that the council have lost, so it's a question, it's a question. How many appeals have the council lost to do with short stay accommodation where the officers have recommended approval? Uh, I'll take that on the first chair. It's bordering on... on oh yeah, it's <laughs> sort of like... <laughs> All right, if there are no further questions, I'll ask um, that we move, uh, somebody uh, move that we... Close the open, open close the, the Close the open, thank you, Alderman Barakas. Those in favour? Aye.